It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This episode is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 4.0 International License. For more information, visit creativecommons.org. Somebody stole our website. Oh no, whatever shall we do? I mean, I guess you could go to the new website, http colon slash slash breakingmathpodcast.app with no www for all you old timers. So breakingmathpodcast.app? I mean, if you're into that sort of thing. Hey, Breaking Math fans. First, I want to thank you for listening. I have an important message for everyone. You can start your own podcast right now with Anchor. Anchor lets you create and distribute your own podcast. Just get an idea, record, and upload. It's just that easy. Anyone can do it. I'm on my way to accomplishing my dream, and you can too. Just get on your device's app store and download Anchor. It contains everything you need to make a podcast. With Anchor, you can put your podcast on all the big platforms. Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, Amazon, and more. Reach the whole world with Anchor. Best of all, Anchor is free. You have nothing to lose with a free platform. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. In a universe where everything is representable by information, what does it mean to interact with that world? When you follow a series of steps to accomplish a goal, what you're doing is taking part in a mathematical tradition as old as math itself, algorithms. From time immemorial, we've accelerated the growth of this means of transformation, and whether we're modeling neurons, recognizing faces, designing trusses on a bridge, or coloring a map, we're involving ourselves heavily in a fantastic world where everything is connected to everything else through a massive network of mathematical factories. So what does it mean to do something? What does it mean for something to end? And what is time relative to these questions? All of this and more on this episode of Breaking Math. Episode 12, Math Factory. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Gabriel. And uh, today on our episode, we have again... It's Amy again. And um, we also have... Leela. And... uh, Today, we're actually going to do uh, some listener mail, Gabriel. That's right. That's right. Li- um, recently, we are actually very excited. We've been getting a little bit of mail, uh, 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 mostly to our, our Gmail account, breakingmathpodcast at gmail.com, but also from our Facebook Messenger. Yes. And uh, the first one is actually from Gabriel's dad. That's right. That's right. Uh, thanks, Dad. Uh, my dad has been listening to us uh, out in Denver, Colorado. And my dad had this this to say. It was, uh, ooh, it's a brief message here. Been listening to the episode, Evolution and Engineering. Not sure I understand it. I'm sure it's fantastic. Love, Dad. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Thank you very much. That, that, that's kind of, I, I, I don't know. I, do you think our, our terminologies are sometimes too elitist? Occasionally. You guys get a little, uh, you get excited about the things that you understand really well. In evolution engineering, that was the one where you were talking about your, your thesis, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So it's really hard to to have perspective on your own work. Yeah, you get entrenched in this world, and then you forget that there's something outside of that world. It's like not being able to see a typo in your own essay. Oh, okay, okay. Isn't that isn't there a term for that? Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, expert blind. Oh yeah, the the expert blind spot is kind of a common uh, phrase in education. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I I'm very thankful for my dad's uh, support. Thank you, Dad, uh, uh, and I, I appreciate your feedback. We always strive uh, for for for. Excellence here. We had one more letter. Uh, this one was was uh, sent to our email, and this is uh, sent in from a gentleman. And um, if you want to email us, that's breakingmathpodcast at gmail.com. 
All of the subjects are interesting, and I would say that my favorite is episode eight. I'm pursuing my Bachelor of Arts in Electrical Engineering. I felt myself wishing I was already working on my master's so I could create an organic algorithm as my final. I'm excited for what you guys have coming down the pipeline, and I have been telling everyone I know about your podcast. It's like you made this podcast specifically for me. Keep up the great work. Oh, and the interactive stuff on the website takes it all to another level. Now, full disclosure, I did not plan that. I did not plan to have two correspondences both about that episode, but it was kind of cool how it worked out. And uh, if you do want to see any of the interactive stuff, it's, of course, at BreakingMathPodcast.com. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. Your, 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 uh, f- your feedback is very meaningful, and you very much can do organic or genetic algorithms for your masters. There are lots of tutorials online for that, and we are excited that this is a topic that interests you. And now... Onto the show. So today on this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about what an algorithm is, uh, what asymptotic complexity or time complexity is. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about general observations about algorithms, um, and we're going to talk about the p equals np problem. Yeah, and and we realize that those are quite uh, that's quite a mouthful. Don't don't run off. Uh, we spend a lot of time breaking down those concepts, and we have a lot of uh, great analogies. So we think it'll be quite helpful and quite interesting. So, Gabriel, what is an algorithm to you? Okay, so I, I, I've, I've been thinking. Um, I've been thinking about this. I think of an algorithm as as a set of instructions where you have an input and then you have some kind of an output at the end, and there's some predictability analogies, uh, or, uh, maybe certain steps of dancing, or perhaps a recipe. Yeah, and in the recipe example, the input is all the ingredients, and the output is you know your um, souffle. And the actual uh, algorithm would be the steps you take to turn those ingredients into a souffle. Yeah, and you could. There's a lot of um, components of an algorithm. For example, loops. Um, when you stir, you don't just stir around the thing one time. You do it multiple times. So it, you stir until completion. The, 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 there could be like a lot of, uh, I guess I'd say, parodies in terms of describing everyday life or or or, or your diary, but just use you know like computer science algorithm notation. I don't know. And one interesting thing is that due to a consequence of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which we won't go into here too much, um, you can use math to prove that an algorithm works, but you can't use an algorithm that isn't random to prove that math works, even though algorithms and math are inexorably intertwined. That 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 is pretty mind blowing, right there. I feel like this should be an XKCD comic about describing your day to day actions as an algorithm in like computer language. That that would be. I love that though. Like you know, a while loop. You know, like keep stirring. You know, like like, like while consistency does not equal, like, you know, whatever. If traffic is greater than some <laughs> yeah. acceptable amount, you alternate I'm, route. <laughs> I'm so down. I'm just uh, I'm fascinated by having diaries that can't be comprehended easily, and that's, that's oh, awesome. dude, like a is, cipher. This is bringing it all together: encryption and algorithms and like information. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but it's relevant. I find the idea of an algorithmic diary somehow a little depressing. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Nerd. Yeah. Okay, okay. So one of the first algorithms um, was Euclid's algorithm. Amy, do you want to go into that? I mean, it's just finding the the greatest common divisor. And so those words, what those literally mean, if you have two uh, numbers, and we're talking whole numbers here, you want the number that is largest that divides into both of those other two numbers. So the, the process itself is pretty simple, as I recall. We recognize that as one of the oldest because, uh, you know, obviously that's from ancient uh, Greece. And uh, so it, it's currently recognized as the This is just a out of curiosity question. Oh, yeah. And, it, yeah, it's one of the oldest um, algorithms that we know about. Um, if not the oldest, I'm not totally sure. Sh- oh, actually, the Babylonian square root method is probably a little older. Okay. But um, the algorithm is actually really simple. And you can imagine it like this. Take two pieces of paper that are as long. So let's say you're doing... Uh, two and ten. You take a piece of paper that's two units long and one that's ten units long. Then you fold up the two unit paper and the ten until you get to an edge. You cut off that edge and compare it and you can just keep doing that over and over again until you get two pieces of paper that are the same size and that's the greatest common divisor. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that in my head as you do it. And again, I, n- I know that there's a bit of a challenge with, with talking about something as you visualize it, but I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Just simple steps. Now, also, real quick, so obviously any sort of a shopping transaction any at all, any shopping tra- transactions or trade from way back in the day, all those are algorithms. You know? Well, I, they're, they're related to algorithms for sure. Okay. Um, I mean, an algorithm is a series of steps that you do to any mathematical construct, mm-hmm. which doesn't necessarily mean 
numbers, but doesn't necessarily mean not numbers. For example, you could do graphs. Mm -hmm. And a graph, for those unacquainted, is not like a graphing calculator type of graph, but it's like uh, you have a bunch of circles that are connected to each other with lines. That's a graph. Okay. Um, you could put that into an algorithm and get something out, like, you know, the largest distance between two nodes, something like that. It's something I've always found annoying that when I watch TV shows or movies and they, they use the word algorithm, like it's some magical, like fancy. It's really simple. It's a system. It's a it's a series of steps that you you take that you have a certain something you put in. You take these steps and you get something out. So, yeah, when you house it, then obviously and someone leaves you a list. Boom. That's an algorithm. Well, the algorithm is actually what you do to get the list done. Oh. So the input is the list and the output is the chores. Okay, okay, cool, cool. That's a little more technical. I like that. So one of the, the introductions that I had to algorithms in general is in linear algebra. So linear algebra is, is in its most basic form dealing with matrices. And so if you're not familiar with matrices, it's just a way of dealing with a lot of numbers at once. Um, so you have, you have a, an array of numbers. And so a matrix will kind of instead of having a bunch of different variables which are the letters which I know everyone who's taken algebra and, and didn't like it hated having numbers in their math that the matrix actually takes or they hated having letters in the math excuse me that the matrix takes letters away and just deals with those numbers those coefficients and so the there's something called row echelon form so when you have a matrix you can reduce it to row echelon form to solve a system of linear equations why might a system of linear equations be worth solving? A system of linear equation. Okay, so th this is interesting. I'd like to break down the answer to this in a, in a few ways. This last week, I had a nephew of mine ask me what a matrix was, and I was suddenly in the position of of, of trying to explain it for him and his little sister. You know, so so I so th th this is all relevant. So so in answering your questions about a system of linear equations, first we need to understand a matrix. I basically said you need to imagine uh, you know a box or 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 you know. Uh, a square and then finally i use the words you know a, a two by two you you've got two you know you've got a row on the top and a row on the bottom if it's a basic two by two you've also got two columns it's funny how how, how we take it for granted how easy that term is you know yeah it, yeah i mean it's kind of um after you see it you know what it is yeah yeah but i mean if you ever used graph paper imagine you just have a little s square that you draw out of graph paper and in each one of the little boxes you draw a number that's a matrix yeah it's just it, it it's a stack of numbers and it's it, it's arranged in a square and there's as many in each row it, 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 you know it's generally a square but not always yeah generally when we're dealing with so we're talking about echelon form row echelon form yes. reduced row echelon form and that's actually called an augmented matrix so okay. it's 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 not a square you have one more column than you have rows okay because that last column mm -hmm. is your solutions oh that's right that's right because so so going back to a system of linear equations let's break this down we know what a matrix is it, it, it it's a square or or sometimes a rectangle of 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 numbers now the last row are the so like if you arrange the numbers in in a bunch of uh, equations where where were the I'm sorry what's the terminology variables thank you uh, well the coefficients of the variable the numbers are on the left side and the answers are on that final column so this is all very difficult to visualize so I'm gonna give you an example of a problem that is solvable using a system of linear equations I actually have a, a really simple one if I may okay um, so say you have a concert and they sold they know that they sold like 2,000 tickets and they know that they made fifty five hundred dollars but they don't actually know that, you know, it's a different cost for kids than it is for adults. They don't know how many adult tickets they sold and how many kids tickets they sold because somebody lost that information. But they need it for um, accounting or for whatever. accounting purposes, whatever it is, right? Based on that information, when we know how many people attended the concert total, how many tickets were sold total, and how much money they made total, as long as we know how much each ticket costs, we can figure out what, how many of each ticket they sold. And of course, that's assuming, again, that you know the total number of tickets sold, right? Because you have to have as many equations as he has unknowns, right? Right. So I'm imagining this as I have 2x equals 16, x equals 8, no big deal. But that's not the point. And then I also have like 3x equals, you know, 21 or whatever. And then in a matrices, it's a silly 4x4, four four, which isn't, like you said, like necessarily always what you're going to get especially when you're using the transforms but it's going to be 2 and 16 and 3 and 21 yeah with the answers on the you have another column uh that which is the um 
which is the number. So let's the say X. Yeah, so like let's say I say that a hot dog and two sodas cost five dollars. Um but a hot dog and a soda cost three dollars. The then you'd have a matrix where the top row is um one, two, five, the bottom one is one, one, three. And you solve that using row echelon form and you see that a hot dog is one dollar and a soda is two dollars. Beautiful. Right. Beautiful. Uh, that That's outstanding. That's outstanding. Yeah. That was and simpler actually, than my example. <laughs> I think that matrices and, and matrix operations are actually some of my favorite math. I mean, you know, like you do an operation on a matrix, and like when you turn it into a row echelon form, if you t- if you explain that super brief, you just operate on the matrix until you got a lot of zeros. Basically, the the top top left, bottom right diagonal can be like all ones. I mean, I mean that's there's so many things. That's reduced row actually. Thank you, thank you. That's right. There's so many things that you can do with matrices, but you can simplify all your operations by by doing operations until you've got a lot of zeros. It's it's I'm unfortunately right now I I recognize that I'm lacking the terminologies, but um, it's like um, in the example that we give where the top row is um, two one five Mm -hmm. uh, and the bottom row is one one three. What you do is you subtract the one from the two and the other one from the other one and then you subtract the three from the yeah. five and then you're left with zero one two yes so one you, soda equals two dollars you right. do you do what's called elementary row operations and yep. so there are things you can do you can multiply by mm-hmm. a scalar which is just any number that's not zero yep. i mean i suppose you could multiply by zero but that would be pointless you can add rows together you can subtract rows and then those elementary you can switch rows those elementary row operations allow you to manipulate the numbers in such a way that you can reduce it to an echelon form or reduced row echelon form, which automatically that last column uh, gives you the solution for each of the unknown variables. Yeah. There's applets that do that. You can just Google search. Term. It's on it's on graphing calculators. So yep. Any any TI graphing calculator, or probably cast any graphing calculator, you can put RREF and it'll simplify any size system that you have the patience to type into it. Cool. Which is awesome that with, you know, two variables, it's actually, it's probably more effort than it's worth to Mm -hmm. convert it to a matrix and reduce it that way. You could just solve it in that time. Mm -hmm. But if you have three variables or four variables or five or six, it's it's really easy to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a, 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 a solving a problem for my job, actually, where there's about uh, 300 variables. Yeah, see, I'm not doing that by hand. (laughs) <laughs> cool, cool. That's why uh, in this modern era of computation, it's just awesome because we can manipulate data so quickly and use these matrix operations. That sounds that sounds technical. Those, I think I think thanks to Hollywood movies, those words are fun. Oh yeah, and this goes back um, like thousands of years. Um, this matrix operations it goes back to the Chinese actually. Yeah. So for a computer, it's very easy to reduce a matrix down to reduced row echelon form, and doing it by hand is very time consuming, and it's easy to make mistakes. So it's it's a very simple algorithm for a computer to execute very quickly, um, which I think leads us into some other types of algorithms. So there's a story in computer science, um, and it's about this painter. He was hired to paint lines on a road, you know, like the lines that you see when you drive down the road, those. And the first day he paints 10,000 lines and they're really impressed with him. They only expected him to paint a thousand lines. So they give him a bonus, whatever, etc. He comes back the next day. They're a little less impressed with him. He only paints about 1100 lines, but they're like, that's oh, still good. Third day, he paints about 30 lines and then they go to him and say, okay, what gives? And he's like, well, don't blame me. The bucket keeps getting further away. <laughs> okay. Now, so for computer scientists, then, can you explain how that's especially funny for, for computer scientists? Yeah, because there's this thing that we're going to go into now called asymptotic complexity. Don't run away from that. It's not as scary as it sounds. It's basically how long an algorithm takes. Um, so you could have a, sim- a better algorithm for painting the road where you just carry the bucket with you. Um, and that would take what's called linear time. But we'll get into all these terms in just a second. So maybe explain... Because I wasn't entirely clear on this, the importance of knowing how long an algorithm. So it's, we talk about the timing of an algorithm, right? We talk about uh, linear time and sublinear time and all these things that we're talking about. Why do we care? Let's say we want to do a task and we know that the input is a certain size. And we know that the output is a certain size based on the input um, and that it takes a certain st- amount of time based on the input. Let's say that we know that for a small problem. Let's say we want to m- do a much bigger problem. Um, knowing how long it actually takes for the algorithm to run tells us whether or not that's feasible in human time or not. For example, 
there are some algorithms that for a size for an input of size two, um, they run in like literally a microsecond. For an input of size four, it would take longer than the heat death of the universe a billion times over. And what I'm talking about is the Ackerman function, but we won't go into that. Hmm. So the emphasis on whether or not running an algorithm is even feasible. Why why is that important? What is that effect? Like why wouldn't we just go ahead and try it and then give up at some point? Well, because we want to be able to predict whether we could do it or not. It's much more of an engineering question than it is a math question. Because there are algorithms that are that run in like finite time for infinite sets of data, awesome things that you can do with algorithms that way, where it's just interesting what the asymptotic complexity is, but it's not necessary to know. Um, but it, 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 what's interesting about it is that there are certain problems that seem like they'd be really easy, um, but really aren't. So, for example, any map that you have, um, like do you take a, take a map off of your wall, um, assuming you have a map on your wall, you could color in that map with at most four colors. But to figure out if a map is colorable within th with only three colors is one of those problems where doubling the size of the problem would make it billions or trillions of times more complicated. So real quick, with respect to the map problem, so what we say is if we look at a map of the United States, you say it requires four colors. Is that because of the tangential states and the borders? You know what I mean? Like you need four colors so you don't have two, two states that are you know, the same color right next to each other? A little bit, yeah. It's a little bit more involved. It has to do with um, with gra with graphs. But suffice it to say that you can't color it, uh, or I don't think you can. I'm not sure if anybody's actually calculated that yet. The uh, map of the United States with three colors. I think that makes sense. No, no, no. That really makes sense because you know if you've got bordering states, and, and again, depending on the shape, I, I think you're right. The the question is, is it dependent on the shape of the states? Because it, it technically it's possible to have you know you know like a state with big states around it. You know that may allow for that. I'm not sure, but that's actually you know a really good point. You know, like I don't know, you've got like Colorado surrounded by New Mexico and you know Nevada and. I, I'm not gonna yeah, it's it's difficult. It's a difficult Utah. problem. Can we edit that out, <laughs> please? As I recall, the the map uh, the map coloring problem has yet to to have a satisfactory proof, right? Oh, the four color one. Yeah, I mean, there's a computer based proof that did it perfectly, but um, there's not an elegant Erdosian proof. What's an Erdosian? Oh, like you know, Paul Erdos. Er oh, Paul Erdos. Erdos. Paul Erdos. 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 Yeah, Paul Erdos. my favorite mathematician. Okay, that's right. That's right. Okay. But um, so one problem that's really um, that, that kind of illustrates the difference between certain di types of complexity is the traveling salesman problem. So um, if you've ever been on a road trip and you want to plan the fastest route between different places, it's an extremely difficult problem. It takes what's called exponential time, meaning for every city that you add to your road trip, you basically double the amount of steps that it takes to find a possible solution. And that's using the clever method. Interesting, interesting. I'm, I'm, is there a way you can do uh, break down that analogy a little bit? Yeah, sure. So think about how many different routes there are between different cities. Okay. Um, so if you have two cities, there is one route, right? So yeah, so Albuquerque that we are based in and then the next uh, neighboring town, let's just say Santa Fe. So we've got, you know, the freeway is one route. I-25. Right. Yeah. Uh, but we're assuming that we, we're assuming that we already know the fastest route between two cities. Okay. For, for any two cities, we already know it. Okay. But we're so let's say we add in um, Las Lunas. Okay. It is, it'll go. F it, it's faster to go from here to Las Lunas to Santa Fe than it is to go from here to Santa Fe to Las Lunas. Right. Right. But so but there but here we have already um, we have two different routes. We add in another city. We have six different routes. We add in another city. We have thirty different routes, and it's, it's actually factorial. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, so what we're saying is that there's and the not... next one be twenty four yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I miscalculated that <laughs> grossly. Okay, so, <laughs> so what we're saying, I'm sorry. So as you said earlier, there is not currently a solution to the traveling salesman problem. There is a solution, but not a polynomial time solution. It's just awful. Yeah, yeah. What's, it, what's, it, so, it diverges quickly. Sorry, what's the, can you explain to, uh, what a what, what a polynomial solution is for our listeners who are not like how that is different than other solutions? Yeah, sure. Um, it's different because a polynomial solution is something where, all right, it, there's what's called linear time, where, which is the simplest polynomial one, where like if you double the su input size of your problem, it takes twice as long. There's quadratic time, where you input it and it takes two times two times as long, so four times as long. 
Um, an example of that kind of algorithm would be sorting a deck of cards in the worst way possible, picking the the smallest card every single time and then putting it in a new in a new stack. Wait, are you telling me there's a better way to do it than that? So real quick, let's just pretend. Uh, you know, you had mentioned cards. Let's just pretend that 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 I said to you, Jonathan, that I said, "Oh, you mean that there's a there's a better way to sort cards than going through one by one and finding the next smallest card?" I had no idea. Can you tell me about it? And I'd say certainly, my good man. Uh, what you do is you divide the card into two stacks, the uh, deck card into two stacks. You divide each of those into two stacks and keep doing that until you have a bunch of pairs. Um, then you sort each pair and then you just go back up sorting them back together and then that's actually called what's uh called n log n time uh which means that if you double the size of the problem it'll do a little bit more than doubling the size of the input but not much wow okay okay yeah so i was aware that there are more efficient ways but that actually is uh, very helpful sorting cards this is a great and this is another great analogy for helping non-computer scientists to understand and gra- to grasp why sorting data is an important thing yeah and let, let's say you already had the card sorted um to find a certain card in the pile would take a very short amount of time. You just divide it in half and divide it in half again and again and again until you find it. Wow. And is there is there is there an algorithm for the fastest way to mess up a card stack? Actually, um, that's one of those really difficult, uh, more difficult than you might expect problems because there's this algorithm called Bogo sort. Okay, and it's uh, you it's you shuffle the deck of cards and then you check if it's sorted and if it's not, you shuffle it again. <laughs> I'm going to give an example now of a problem that's solvable in a very short amount of time and one that's solvable in a very long amount of time. Let's say I have a convex polytope. Uh, All that is is something like a gemstone. Where um, Gabriel, do you want to talk about what a convex polytope is, real sure. quick? Sure, sure. So, so uh, those of us who who may uh, recall from, I believe, uh, you know, sixth and seventh and eighth grade science, uh, uh, convex is typically the term used to describe a lens that is, uh, I guess, we'll say, sticking outward. You know, like if you hold a cereal bowl upward, well, a bowl itself is not convex. It's um, Concave. Concave. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. So a cereal bowl is concave. So convex, if you flip the cereal bowl around, uh, or, you know, it depends on how you look at the lens, obviously. So, um, and then and then polytope. So that's many, and then tope refers to uh, t- uh, topography. Surfaces, yeah. yeah. So convex is as it's, you know, sticks out like a bowl turned upside down, polytope, many surfaces. Yeah. So it means that, it, so for example, um, a, a dumbbell would not be a convex polytope because it has concave uh, parts. Um, which are like little like divots and stuff like that. Uh, you take a ball that's a convex polytope kind of, if you you could approximate it with one, but you, as soon as you have like um, a bowling ball where it has holes in it, that's no longer convex. What about like an overinflated soccer ball? The, all the, the kind of, are they hexagons that are uh, together? Oh, yeah. That if you inflated the hexagons, that that's, it's convex instead of concave? Oh, that would still not be um, a convex polytope because the seams um, go into the ball. Okay, if we had a smooth, overinflated. Oh yeah, then that would be a convex okay, polytope. There you go. And so let's say we have this convex polytope, and we have a light source that's very far away, and we want to find the bright, but it's just far away enough so that basically there's a gradient, um, meaning a smooth thing that goes from one color to the other on the surface of this polytope, and we want to find the brightest corner of the polytope. What we do is that we just pick a random edge. And we just go along the edges of the polytope until we find the brightest one. And that takes a very short amount of time. If there's um, n surfaces, it takes about n cubed time to solve that. Now let's get an example that's actually very difficult to solve. Um, This takes about 2 to the n steps. Let's say that we had a grid inside of this polytope. And, um, And we wanted to find the grid point that was brightest. So we look at the grid points inside of the polytope, not the stuff on the surface. That takes an insanely long amount of time. And there's no polynomial algorithm that's known that actually solves that. So I just want to point out that it's not necessarily intuitive that n cubed is is considerably uh, smaller, I guess, than 2 to the n. That you, you n cubed is n to the third power. If you think about, let's try 10, if I do 10 cubed, that's 1,000. If I do 2 to the 10, do you happen to know what that is? Oh, it's 1,024. 1,024. So they're about the same there. But let's say we pick 20. Um, yeah, then we have 800. We have 800. I mean, not 800. We have 8,000 
versus about a million. You pick 30, you get 27,000 versus a trillion. Yeah, so two to the N gets bigger much more drastically as N increases than N cubed does. Yeah, so like let's say you wanted to solve a problem for a polytope with 100 um sur- with 100 uh surfaces on it. It would take about 2 to the 100th or 1 novillion uh steps, uh which if you did a trillion steps a second would still take much longer than the heat death of the universe. Now again, for those who don't know, the heat death of the universe is a long, long time. Oh yeah. Well, I should hope so. So I would like to point out that uh, when we talk about polynomial versus exponential, um, and there's there's different versions of this as well. There's there's uh, linear and logarithmic. So logarithmic is the inverse of exponential. So as quickly as exponential goes terribly, as it explodes, that's how slow it is for logarithm to go bad. Oh yeah. So if you had like a a if you double the amount of inputs, you only increase the time by one step. So could you say that one's enthusiasm for a school semester would be a logarithmic thing? <laughs> well, I, I guess it would be, unless it might be exponential decay, actually. Yeah, I feel like that's decay. It definitely is decreasing as time goes on. Exponentially. You could say that the, um, that the disdain that one has for the school is exponential. Okay, okay, fair enough. I hope not. <laughs> No, no, we're all nerds. You know, everyone here loves school. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love school. I want to be done with my masters. <laughs> no, right? Sorry. I'm ready. I'm ready to be done. I think that's true of everyone pretty much the moment they start it. So we talked about the different um, asymptotic complexities that we have. Sublinear time, which is essentially logarithm, which we just talked about. We have linear time, which is just a straight line that pretty much input and output are directly correlated. And then we have n log n time, polynomial time, exponential time, and we talked a little bit about how exponential is about as bad as it gets, right? Or is there something above that? Oh, there's there's some stuff that's so much more than that. Um, the stuff for, of nightmares. Oh, yeah. Like, for example, uh, the Ackerman function. Uh, so yeah. the Ackerman function is you take in two numbers, m and n. If m is 0, it's n plus 1. If n is greater than 0 and n is equal to 0 then it's Ackerman function of m minus 1 and 1. And if m is greater than 0 and n is greater than 0, then it's Ackerman function of m minus 1 and the Ackerman function of m and n minus 1. So that was that was kind of gibberish. What, what is that in non-m and n? And- so what it is is it's a function that it, you kind of pass it back into itself two-thirds of the time, or, or I guess most of the time, and the other bit of the time you increment it. So it's a really simple function, really. Uh, if you, you, you should look it up online. So I'm thinking, you know, of, of a math torture chamber, if, if there was such a thing, would this sort of be like, like the ultimate torture? This is like mathematical waterboarding. <laughs> well, a little bit. Like, for example, um, the Ackerman function of like of one and one is three. The Ackerman function of three and two is 29. But um, the Ackerman function of four and two is a number with about 19,000 digits. So you could bring this into an interrogation room and probably get some information out of somebody. You know, I'm just saying. It feels reminiscent of a chaotic system of, of like a setting up like the Mandelbrot set or any any fractal is a fairly simple construct, but if you pick a number outside of the set, it goes poorly very quickly. A little bit like that, yeah. It, it's just, yeah, with this. And the thing is, you could only calculate this thing one step at a time. Can I just say I need to make a, a disclosure here for our listeners? We're 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 really not trying to scare you away from algorithms. We're we're trying to make you love algorithms. So I want to make sure that I am meeting that end. We want you to appreciate them. Yes, yes. There's the uh, algorithms are amazing, and algorithms are how our our world operates, and I, I think they're awesome. I, I was I was teasing about the torture chamber thing. You know, I just thought it was funny. Now, one thing that might. Uh scare you a little bit about algorithms is the p versus np problem oh yes so basically the thing is this there are certain problems that we know for example coloring a graph with three colors like we mentioned before like the knapsack problem which is i give you 19 dollars and 23 cents to spend at a store to find items that add up exactly to that and integer linear programming which is a thing with the jewel and the grid inside of the jewel um they can be transformed into each other. 
So they're equivalent problems. They're basically the same problem told in different ways. If somebody ever discovered a polynomial time algorithm to solve that, that would have huge ramifications for our universe. What it would mean is that any problem that could be verified in polynomial time could be solved in polynomial time because uh, we know for a fact that it takes non-polynomial time to determine the answer to a solution um, for any problem. And so if you could verify any solution in the polynomial time, then that would mean that math would be inherently easy. So quick question before we get too, too far down this rabbit hole. When we talk about polynomial time, would you say that that's the acceptable limit of doing an algorithm that, that like if we discover that an algorithm uh, has exponential time or hyper hyper exponential time that we wouldn't bother computing it yeah basically i mean you but sometimes for polynomial time we would yeah like um if you're doing um i mean not if it's like n to the hundredth um, but if it's like n cubed into the fourth maybe even into the fifth yeah you could kind of attempt it if it's exponential you're only going to do it on very small data sets okay so amy uh as i understand you researched a little bit about the p versus np problem uh what what were your impressions so the the main difference i could or the the main description of p versus np as i recall and correct me if i'm wrong that uh so we have polynomial and np do you remember what that stands for i think non-deterministic polynomial that is correct uh, Ding. It, yeah, I remembered it as you said it. So the polynomial is the actual, it's the the ability to determine if the problem is solvable. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, to determine if the solution is correct. So if I, if I give you a map and it's three colored, I could verify very quickly that it's, I'd be like, yep, there's only three colors and yep, no two colors are touching. You win the algorithm. Okay, so P is, is whether or not the, the, problem can be verified the solution can be verified whereas np is whether or not the solution can be found is that yeah exactly and if p breakdown? Equal, yeah and if p equals np that means that you could solve any math problem in polynomial time boom that's what's scary and the reason why that's scary is means that there'd be no such thing as privacy anymore it would mean that there'd be no such thing as um insight no such thing as creativity interesting because as soon as we could create the problem we could also solve it yeah. There's, I actually have a quote so, from Scott Aronson at MIT. Uh, he said, if P equals NP, then the world would be a profoundly different place than we usually assume it to be. There would be no special value in creative leaps, no fundamental gap between solving a problem and recognizing the solution once it's found. So then now that has not been solved, obviously. No, it's actually, I think, one of the millennium problems. Um, so if you can solve it, you win a million dollars. If it's solvable. And if you can solve it, everything's meaningless. Basically. <laughs> Well, if you actually, I do wonder if the solution even existed, if that would mean that P equals NP, um, there might be a way of solving it indirectly in a really creepy way. But yeah, for the most part, I think the consensus in the scientific community uh, is that it, it cannot be solved or that it cannot be true. Um, there's still a small population of, of computer scientists, I think specifically, who I think are just like hoping that it's true because it is very elegant. Um and it means that computers can actually do the work of mathematicians, which I think all computer scientists secretly hope. I mean, I think that they will be able to do the work of mathematicians once they have the same intelligence as humans, but not before then and not in any predictable way. Uh, so you say that nothing would be safe anymore. So could you go into a little more detail about what you mean by that? Yeah, um, that one I'm stretching a little bit on. Uh, but what it means is that... Um, if okay, what it means is that if you can factor not because all you're talking about cryptography essentially, right? Yeah, and so and you could verify very easily that something is like you know signed correctly if you're given a certain set of data. So if you could reverse that, if p equals n p, essentially, that would mean that we'd be able to there'd be no function that's harder to go one way than the other way, basically. Right. So just as quickly as we create the security, we can break it. Yeah, which would mean that there's no fundamental security in the universe. Google's algorithm is a pretty simple algorithm, but it's one of those algorithms that you would think is a lot more complicated than it has to be. Um, so let me break, uh, let's break it down. Um, it's called PageRank at its base. And what it is, is you ha let me define the problem. You have a bunch of websites or nodes. They're all connected to other websites using links. You have to rate these links by how 
important they are. And then you have to determine how important a web page is by its links. Now, it's a little bit of a circular problem because if you have a link from a very important website, then you have a very high rank on the page rank scale. Even though it, you might have more a rank than somebody with few with a lot more links, but to meaningless things like you know viruses, um, and that's the problem with uh, that's a problem, and it's one of those problems actually solvable in polynomial time, and the way that it works is very simple. So what we're talking about here is what happens when you type something into a Google search bar. So when you go to Google and type something in and search something it performs this algorithm that then brings up all these results. And so what Jonathan is describing to you right now is what's happening after you press enter. Yeah. And one thing about a matrix is that it does what's called a linear transformation on a vector. Uh, don't run away. What it means is you just take a, you just take a bunch of numbers, you do a certain transformation that's very predictable with a matrix, and you get a new vector out. Uh, vector meaning list of numbers. You know, I want to say something really quickly. This is a slightly off topic, but very justified. Uh, there are some phenomenal YouTube videos on linear algebra that gave me a, an appreciation for it and an understanding for it while I was working my way through my master's in electrical, electrical engineering. So all, all, you know, all of our students out there, uh, uh, there's so many phenomenal uh, videos on YouTube that show you what all this means and the relevancy. And I felt like I had to say that for some of our listeners. Oh, yeah. YouTube is a uh, fascinating and uh, thing when it comes to math, especially linear algebra. There's a lot of good things. And we do urge you to check that out after the episode. Yeah. Yeah, just Google it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, uh, I was Googling something while we were talking about that, and it's really meta and mind-blowing, and I would recommend it for our listeners. Now, what's cool about these, this matrix is that it, the entry, so like, let's say you entry like M rows down, N columns in, means that you connect the M, Mth web, web page to the Nth web page if it's one. Um, now, that, you know, you do a little, little finagling with this, and you... Um, like if a link is near the top of your page, it's probably more important. So you change the numbers a little bit based on that. And then you just multiply this out matrix again and again and again and again to your stuff uh, using this um, using the page rank algorithm. And then it stabilizes after a while. It just kind of magically does that. And you get the page rank of every website. Somehow it sounds very simple and yet incomprehensible all at the same time and a lot of good algorithms are kind of like that <laughs> um, there's back propagation which uh, is as simple as taking the derivative and changing a, a neural network based on derivatives um, but using that we can solve highly nonlinear problems um, there's um, cal there's calculating um, the stresses on bridges using matrices and that just comes out magically too um, there's so many magic things about algorithms. Can I ask real quick, just to just to help round out my understanding of search algorithms, you, you just explained the Google search algorithm. Can we explain some other internet search algorithms and talk about how they differ? Uh, that's um, Well, there's the naive version of it where you just look for um, web pages based on how many uh, terms are the same in, in your search versus the um, thing that you find. Uh, the problem with that is that it doesn't take um, relevancy into account, so you don't get the awesome Google effect of getting exactly what you want. We're not sponsored by Google. Promise. <laughs> yes. We're just in awe of them. Okay. And uh, every almost every search algorithm now is based on page rank. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know what's interesting? I I love thinking about the evolution of algorithms. You know, including including like in libraries like the Dewey Decimal System. You know, and just like different ways of sorting information and accessing it because that's a very relevant question in today's world. You know, so that's. I don't know. It, it's very interesting to think about. Oh, it definitely is. Um, there's also facial recognition algorithms, which run in polynomial time. Um, and the, what the way that these work is you have these things called eigenfaces, which represent all the possible different matrices that can be added up to make anybody's face. That's insane. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. An eigenface. So the face obviously is just this topological shape, but that's how we identify each other. That's how, you know, we know you from me, you know. So, so I know there's face swap on, on, on some of these apps. What is it? Uh, uh, Snapchat? Mm -hmm. um, Something like that. So that uses creepy. facial, creepy facial recognition software. Wow, that's insane. I feel like eigenfaces would be the name of, a, like, a dystopian movie or novel or something like eigenfaces 
Wow. Like face off, yeah. but like eigenfaces. Right, the mathematical <laughs> dystopia that is eigenfaces. They see a face and they don't not know who it belongs to. <laughs> that sounds so bad. <laughs> is there is there is, is there been an eigenfaces joke about about the Snapchat thing yet? I, there should be. I, I don't know. Or, or the movie Face Off. You know, like, like face swap and face off. Can't there be a Nicolas Cage and John Travolta uh, face swap, swap? Sorry, tangent. <laughs> Hashtag math puns. <laughs> I feel like eigenfaces that you'd, you'd have to have like, because I'm the only keyword I'm coming up with is eigenvalue, which I know pertains to matrices in some regard, but I don't for the life of me remember what it is or Eigen, how it's used. Eigenvalue is like if you apply a matrix to a vector and the vector doesn't change direction, that's an eigenvalue. So, so I was gonna say okay. eigenvalues are the unchanging ones, consistent through time. They're like the sacred. Uh, so maybe eigenfaces would be those that are unchanging through time. Yes. Well, it, it, they're that we found the perfect eigenface and we have to leave it there. And okay. there's there's no more development in humanity. Well, I, the, I mean, the, <laughs> I, you could use eigenfaces to make like a quote unquote perfect face if you take these faces and you link them to each other using page rank. And then... <laughs> this is like your your your, your big double decker sandwich with all of our topics. We're just putting them together, guys. Just putting them together. <laughs> and then you use genetic algorithms. Go back and watch episode uh, episode eight. Episode eight. Yeah, yeah. And then you use the genetic algorithm to further optimize the perfect face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you could use a traveling salesman problem to <laughs> find the best route to display this face in front of this crowds. This is your your triple decker special sandwich. And what would be your sauce you know yeah i have some kind of special sauce here now the master theorem no we're not going to talk about the master <laughs> theorem i was gonna say shannon's information theory there you uh, go yes. that's right entropy <laughs> dude entropy How could we miss that uh, dude work in entropy here come on you're on a roll <laughs> and then we introduce a random component it falls into crumbs well, actually, it decays over time you know the whole sandwich the whole mathematical sandwich decays over time that's entropy right yeah and actually Let's talk a little bit about randomization and what it does to algorithms real quick and just some general design philosophies when it comes to algorithms. Random algorithms are actually a lot more robust than deterministic algorithms. But, yeah, so so I think random as though like not thought out. You know what I mean? Like like you don't say just hand me a random tool, would you? You know what I mean? But but in this case you do. You can almost think of random as having as being in some sense and we're not going to go very deep into this because it's terrifying, but free will. <laughs> So, so, so randomness, I'm sorry, so randomness is one of the justifications for the idea of free will, right? Or like you almost imbuing algorithms with their own little degree of free will by giving them randomness. Oh, okay. So, 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 so in the beginning, God created algorithms and gave them randomness. Okay, I'm not. Something like that. <laughs> but uh, there's this, gen and we don't, we know very little about this um, because like our general rule of thumb is that if it works more than a third of the time, then it's kind of a good algorithm. It's such a rough estimate. But some other things about algorithms is that in general, you could trade space and time. Um, so if an algorithm takes a lot of space, which uh, means that if it takes a lot of computer memory to solve, um, then you could do it faster. But if you can, so let's, Think about the sorting algorithm. If I if I don't have a big old huge table to lay out a bunch of cards on, I'm kind of limited to the uh, sh to picking out the smallest de the smallest card every single time and putting it in a new deck. So you get to kind of trade space for time. Also, bigger problems are solvable relatively more quickly. Can we put a gong in there? Because I just got what you were talking about. <laughs> oh, totally. Just now. <laughs> That's the oh, breaking math inspiration gone. That was so anticlimactic. Oh, she was sorry. so excited. <laughs> I was so excited. It didn't yeah. work. We could try again. Oh, man. So the thing with the bigger problems are solvable more quick, quickly. Um, an example of that. Relatively more quickly. Relatively, right? yeah. Right. Is um, m multiplication. Multiplication, when you do it, you have to multiply every number by every other number, when you're every numeral by every other numeral or whatever, when you're multiplying two numbers together in the way that you're taught in school. So it takes n squared time. However, there's an algorithm that you could do it in um, n to the log three of two time, which is actually uh, infinitely faster given infinitely large numbers. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Can you? I, I have a challenge that I always want to do: the breaking math challenge, where where I say explain what you just said to 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 like a uh, like an eight year old. Like, how would you say n to the log three to an eight year old? What would you say to him? I would say, when you fall down, you go faster and faster every time. That's different than running. So it's somewhere between running and falling in how fast it is. 
Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Now it's like th- falling with a parachute. Okay. A little okay. bit. So a, a slight. So so maybe, uh, or or falling through tree branches that slows you down a little bit. It's like falling through tree branches with three tree branches get thinner and thinner and thinner very slowly. <laughs> That's a good math problem. <laughs> it's insane, man. But I don't yeah. feel like this is going to give the three-year-old a very positive experience Are we going to fail with this? Math, Are we going to fail? Oh, no. Oh, no. So I'm trying to, I'm just trying to it out. associate math with falling through trees. <laughs> oh, no. Well, then think, oh, okay. that's horrible. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Um, so, but let's say you, in this called Katatsuba's algorithm for multiplication, and he actually developed it in one week after he saw a lecture where the professor said you can't solve it in faster than n squared, and he said, I'll show you. But you have to have numbers that are about 600 digits long to make it worthwhile. I'm sorry. I heard that, and I thought of an algorithm for challenge uh, confident mathematician algorithm. You know what I mean? Like, if you want to find a more, if you want to find innovation, here's your algorithm. Just, like, find, you know, a bunch of experts and, and, and challenge them. No, I'm just kidding. For student in college, yes. apply disappointing lecture. <laughs> <laughs> apply challenging lecture. For student. Yeah, 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 I know. That, that, I mean, that's just pretty, that's pretty standard reverse psychology. Is yes. Tell someone they can't do something. It's the only thing they want to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, obviously, that that's not, that's to be taken with a grain of salt, clearly. Because, you know, you know, there are times where you can't do something, you know, you know, but. I was just, I was just trying to think. That of it. sounds like a challenge. So says you. <laughs> I could do anything. Okay. Oh yeah. Can you be a better Gabriel Hesh than me? Uh oh. I bet. I, I, not <laughs> I don't know this. that I'd ask Jonathan if he could do something better than you. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to face my own. I just had a horror movie like in my mind. <laughs> Just saying. Funny story. Funny story. We're we now... already talked about face off and eigen yeah. phases that I don't think I want to challenge Jonathan to take over your face, Gabriel. Algorithms are a way of interacting with a mathematical landscape, and they give us an appreciation for space and time. We've explored everything from coloring graphs to Google search algorithms to the philosophical ramifications of the famous P equals NP problem. It's clear at this point that algorithms, or their study thereof, is a nascent science, but a rich one indeed. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Gabriel. And this has been Breaking Math. Um, on Breaking Math, today we had... Amy Lynn. And Amy, is there anything you'd like to plug? I love my school. I work at the Public Academy for Performing Arts, an 8th APS charter school that does 6th through 12th grade. Uh, if you're someone in Albuquerque who is interested in performing arts, your, your child is, presumably, you should send them on over to Papa. Awesome. And uh, we are brought to you in conjunction with KUNM Generation Listen. Um... Leela, is there anything you'd like to plug about that? We are wrapping up. It has been our great pleasure to help you gentlemen bust out, what, 12 episodes of Breaking Math. Super cool. Look forward to having you on my live Freeform show soon and again in the future. And we'll be back on campus quite active and with a vengeance next semester. Look for us at Welcome Back Days. Thank you. Yes, now, in the will. meantime, you're, you're not going to. Um, we're still going to be bringing you bra- breaking math episodes. Yes. Oh, we are. Re- we are really excited. We've. Yes. We we will be recording over the summer in a variety of topics and have a variety of guests expanding our our uh, uh, expanding our topics quite a bit. And uh, we'll keep bringing you the same great content you've come to expect. Thanks for listening. I don't know. <laughs>